are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Come on. I'm trying to film this for class. All right, folks. So I didn't build a fire tonight because it's really late. And uh, I'm just kind of tired from everything. But uh, I'm sitting here with, with Emma. See, so she's just kind of sleeping in her little hole thing. Or the little bouncy seat. She's just chilling. Look at that. Yeah. I wish I could sleep that soundly. I haven't slept that soundly in a lot of years. But anyways, uh, just as a reminder, today is Tuesday. And you guys have uh, your test on Friday on the calling of the disciples. Tomorrow, when I come back to class, we'll take a look at the 12 apostles in section 25. Um, so just make sure that you are ready to go for that. Uh, I'm going to show you a video that I made two years ago. For the calling of the disciples, right, from uh, Matthew through the uh, wedding feast at Cana. So all the information is going to be the same uh, from that video as what I normally would teach. So rather than reteach it, I'll just show you that same video. All right. Um, I think at that point, my dog's still a puppy. So you get to at least see her as a puppy um, since that's two years ago. At least I think she might pop in there at some point. We'll see. I don't remember. All right. And, um... If you need anything, I'm out at Stella for the day, so just send me an email. If I forget to upload the notes, just send me an email, and uh, I'll do that. But I'll try my best to remember. All right? Have a great day. Find uh, eBackpack for any other information or notes that we need for today. So uh, nothing else. Enjoy the fireside chat uh, from two years on the Calling the Disciples, section 17, starting with Matthew. All right? Enjoy your day. All right, chapter 2, verse 13, right? The call of <coughs> Levi. Levi is also known as Matthew, right? So highlight that in verse 14, Levi, all right? Uh, A.K.A. Matthew and his job. What's Matthew's job? Tax collector. Now, do the people like the tax collectors? You can say it. No, no, right? So this is the way it would work. Um, the tax Romans were brilliant at doing this. Uh, at, at getting people to kind of, you know, pay their taxes. So what they would do is they would go into an area and they would conquer the area and they would make their own people be the tax collectors. So, for example, from now on, every time you come into my classroom, there's a 25 cent tax to come into Mr. Moran's class. It's so, it's so much fun, right? Tuition's not enough. 25 cent tax for each one of you uh, to come into my class from now on. And I'm going to have one of you collected for me, right? So whoever is the third person in the fourth row, third person, fourth row, you're not a tax collector, um, you know, a tax collector for the period. And here's how it works. Every day they come in, they have to give you a quarter. But I don't care how much money you take from them. You can charge them a dollar. So every day they come into class, you say to them, look, give me a dollar or you can't come into class. And if you're late coming into my class, then you're in trouble. Right, so they give you the dollar, you pay me the 25 cents, and you keep the other 75 cents for yourself. You get rich, offer your classmates, offer your own people, offer your, your, your colleagues, offer your, your peers. Right, so are they going to like you? Probably not. They're going to meet you outside of the flagpole at 3 o'clock, right, teach you what they, what they really think about your 75% your extra tax there. Right, they're not going to be happy about this. Right, that's exactly who Matthew was. Matthew was this tax collector. Nobody liked him. Right? Uh, and real simple. Jesus goes up to him in verse 14, follow me. And he got up and he followed him. Right? And people are like, what is he doing eating with tax collectors and sinners? Right? How could this man, right, who, who is so holy, be eating with tax collectors and sinners? And it all comes to a head in verse 17. Jesus heard what they were saying and said, those who are not who are well do not need a physician, but the sick do. I do not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Highlight that. Those who are well do not need a physician, but the sick do. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. This is the note I want you to put down. We are all sick. Right? You don't go to a doctor unless you're not feeling well. If you go to a doctor, and you're just like, yeah, I'm doing great. I just want to make sure nothing's wrong with me. You know, you do like once a year for a physical. But otherwise, you don't go to a doctor unless you're sick. Unless you think there's something wrong with you. So if you don't think something's wrong with you, then you ask, but never ask to be healed. Right? If you don't think you're a sinner, then you never ask for forgiveness. Which is why Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous. In other words, I didn't come to call people who think they're righteous. I'm not here for people who think they're sinless, who think they're righteous. Because you know what? Those are the people who I can't help. 
Because in order to be helped, you have to ask for forgiveness. All right, so this is the note. We are all sick. The question is whether or not we seek out a doctor. We are all sick, guys. The, the disease we all have, including myself, I'm the biggest one here, is called sin. All right, and that disease, right, uh, whether or not we think we have it, right, even though we all do, is when we ask for forgiveness. We go to a priest and ask for confession. All right? Um, so there's a lot of things I highlight in the commentary. Let me just make sure the screen went blank, so I just want to make sure that um, it didn't um, shut me off here. So bear with me. I don't want to redo this whole thing again because this is brilliant so far, I know. All right, 17 minutes. we got 21 minutes left. All right, so second line in the commentary. This is what you're highlighting. These two disciples are believed to be Andrew, the brother of Peter, and John, the beloved disciple. Keep highlighting. St. John the Baptist will refer to Jesus, the Lamb of God, which connects Jesus' mission to the Passover, uh, which saves Israel from the 10th plague. Skip the next sentence. Highlight the last sentence of the commentary. Nathaniel is the disciple with whom there is no guile, and sometimes referred to as Bartholomew. All right, so there should be three sentences highlighted in the, um, the commentary. The second, the third, and the last one. All right, good. Moving on to section 18, a calling of Simon the Fisher. I'm going to shut this because it's getting kind of hot here. All right, my feet are sweating in my Uggs. All right, it's not, not going to be a pretty picture later. It's not going to be a pretty picture. All right, good. I'm going to get a drink. Everyone take a break. Stretch out a little bit. All right, section 18. Here's how we go. Jesus, right, approaches Simon Peter. And Simon's been fishing all night. And he hasn't caught a single thing. All right, now, have you ever been fishing? The, the, the idea of fishing really in, intrigues me. Uh, my brother's always like, hey, yo, go, let's go fishing. And I'm like, sure, let's go. And after about four minutes and like five casts, I'm like, this stinks. Right? And then after like seven or ten minutes, I'm like, what a gigantic waste of my time. I don't even like fish. I'm not going to eat the fish if I catch it. I haven't even gotten a couple of nibbles. What am I doing here? Peter's a fisherman. He's been out all night, and he hasn't caught a single thing. And Jesus comes up to him at Lake Genesaret, right? How, just take a, take a look at that. It's the bowl for also known as the Sea of Galilee. All right, and it says to him, have you caught anything? He's like, no. And he goes, all right, let's go out and cast out into the deep. Let's go into the deep water. Let's go into the water, which has the most amount of fish, but it's the hardest amount to catch. Right? And Peter's like, come on, man. We haven't caught a single thing yet. But all right, if you say we should go, then we're going to go. All right? And in verse um, 5, all right, let's talk about that. Simon said and replied, Master, we have worked hard all night and have caught nothing, but at your command I will lower the nets. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and the nets were tearing. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come to help them. They came and filled their boats so that they were in danger of sinking. All right, so you just see what happened? Peter says, I don't know, Jesus. I don't know if we're going to go out fishing again. Uh, all right, but we'll go. And after catching nothing all night, they're like, all right, let's throw the nets out here where Jesus tells us to do it. And they catch so many fish that they got to call the other boat over to help them. And the boats are sinking because of the weight of all these fish. And Peter, in verse 8, highlight this. Verse 8, his response, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Jesus is going to call Peter with a substantial amount of fish with a giant catch of fish, because Peter, that's where he is in his life. That's his business. That's what he loves. That's what he cares about, right? Providing for his family and caring for him. What the heck are you doing, Abby? All right. Um, all right, that's where Peter is. And so Jesus is going to show him, look, I have power over everything, including something as simple as fish. And with this massive catch of fish, Peter is going to recognize, I am a sinner. I am a sinful man. I doubted you, and I need forgiveness. Right, so Jesus continues, right, in verse 10, right, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, right, that's James and John, um, James the greater, John the evangelist, right, the beloved disciple, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners of Simon Peter, right, said to Simon, do not be afraid, or Jesus said to Simon in verse 10, do not be afraid, from now on you will be catching men, right, so just highlight that, do not be afraid, from now on you will be catching men, Right, the disciples are going to become fishers of men. In other words, they're going to be seeking to catch um, men, people, humans, for the kingdom of God. Right, spreading the, the good news, spreading the gospel. All right. All right, last thing, highlight in the commentary, last line of the commentary. 
It is this recognition of his own sinfulness and willingness to repent that makes Simon Peter one of the greatest apostles. <laughs> that will be true. What's up? What do you want? Here. Join that. Join that. Okay, good. Um, that's exactly true. Right? <laughs> Simon Peter, right, what makes him so great is not, right, is not that he is not a sinner. What makes him so great, stop it. I don't want to beat you in front of the students. That's right. I just said that. Okay? All right. Like I said, okay? if I beat my kids, no one cares. If I beat my dog, you all start crying and going crazy. All right. All right. That's what makes him so great uh, is that he is willing to ask for forgiveness. All right. Section 18 done. Section 19. How much time am I up to here? Let's see. Uh, 22 minutes. I got plenty of time to do the wedding feast at Cana. All right. What, what do you want? All right, I'll pet you for a little bit. Yeah. All right, so here we go. First, uh, John's Gospel, chapter chapter 2. Right. This here is my favorite Gospel passage. This is why I want to make sure I have enough time. Uh, I can do this in about 12, 13 minutes, even though I'd really like to have a whole period. But this is what we're going to do. Last thing for today, guys. All right, so I know you're, it's, you're getting, it's getting long. This here is my favorite. I wrote a paper on this, a 10-page paper for my master's. Uh, this is the gospel at my wedding. Right, there are so many things going on here. Um, that's just beautiful. Right? This is the start of Jesus' public ministry. All right. So notice, chapter 2 of John's gospel. We, we read the prologue already. Right? It says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. Pause. All right. Highlight on the third day. Right? Third day. And all I want you to do is put in the note, see pop up above. Let's go. Did you know at the very top? Notice, right, on the third day. In John's Gospel, chronologically, this is the third day after Nathaniel was called. However, on a theological level, what John is doing is John is outlining the first seven days of Jesus' public ministry. And so on the third day here in John's Gospel, right, of the wedding feast came, is technically really the seventh day. The seventh day of Jesus' opening week ministry, right? And as it says, right, he is implying that creation, which was fashioned in seven days, is being transformed and renewed here through Christ. Jesus, who created the entire world in seven days in the book of Genesis, has now transformed it and renewed it at the beginning of his mission, the beginning of his ministry. Remember, Mary is the new Eve, right? Through the woman who ushered in temptation to the man, right now comes the woman who ushers in her yes, her, her humility to say yes to God, right, which will then bring it to Jesus, who is the new Adam, right? Because through death, uh, from, through Adam came death, and through uh, Christ comes life, all right? So we have this new creation here at the very beginning, all right? Second thing uh, theologically going on is that Jesus is going to manifest his glory here on the third day, just as... Jesus will manifest his glory of the resurrection on the third day after his death. All right, so Jesus is going to start his ministry, the very first miracle he has, on the third day, right, to manifest his glory, to link us to the resurrection, as well as make the connection that God here uh, is recreating, retransforming the world. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 3. When the water ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Interesting. So at the wedding, Jesus is there with his mom and his disciples, right? So Jesus is obviously a pretty important guy if he gets to bring a bunch of guests. Normally, if you're invited to a wedding, you get one guest. But Jesus is invited to a wedding, and he gets a lot of guests. Now, weddings at the time of, the, at the time of Jesus weren't just like what it is here, where it's a one-day affair, right? It was a multiple-day affair, a week-long possibly, even depending upon the type of couple. And it would have been an absolute, complete disaster and embarrassment for the couple to run out of wine. If someone comes over to your house and you run out of food and drinks uh, and anything for them to offer them hospitality, it's an embarrassment for the host. If you go to a party, especially that of a wedding, and you run out of wine um, or food for your host, it's a complete and utter embarrassment on the newlyweds. And so here, Mary recognizes, right? So highlight, they have no wine, and I want you to put this note in, right? Simply, right? Mary just simply brings the problem to Jesus. Notice, she doesn't say to Jesus, they have no wine, go buy them some. She doesn't slip them a 20 and says, here, go buy as much wine as, wine as you can for this. Or give her the credit card. Right? She just simply says to him, they got no wine. 
And you can almost hear her saying, the amount of embarrassment that this new couple, newlywed couple is going to go through is unbelievable. Jesus, they have no wine. Right? And notice Jesus' response. Verse 4. Jesus said to her, Woman, how does your concern affect me? Oof. Right? At first, look, when we, when we read that, we're like, oh, no, you didn't, Jesus. Oh, boy. Right? Imagine, try this. Try this with your mom tonight. Right? You come home, and uh, your mom says something to you like, hey, uh, hey did, did you do your homework tonight? And you just look at you and go, woman, don't tell me what to do. How does your concern affect me? What's going to happen? I hope your mom slaps you right across the face, and your dad's not far behind you for disrespecting your mother. Right? If you refer to your mom as woman, like, woman, don't talk to me. Woman, leave me alone. Woman, how does your concern affect me? I hope, I hope your parents give you a nice little back end. Because that's just extremely disrespectful. Is Jesus disrespecting his mom? You know, when he says to a woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. No. Of course Jesus is not disrespecting his mom. Right? So just highlight that. Right? Put down, Jesus is not disrespecting his mom. And see the pop-up in the top right-hand corner of the end of plot thickens. All right? Remember, Genesis chapter 3, the proto-evangel, the woman, right, is going to receive her punishment. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. The woman was Eve. The woman here is Mary. Her seed is Jesus. And her seed is about to destroy the head of the evil by starting his public ministry. All right? So he is not in any way disrespecting his mom. He is rather making the connection to the fact that Mary is the new Eve. And what he is about to do is fulfill Genesis 3.15. Also notice down at the very bottom, um, John is never ever going to name Mary in his gospel. She's always referred to as woman or the mother of Jesus. All right, so Mary continues, right, in verse 5. Right, so Jesus says, Woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour is not yet come. Verse 5, His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Highlight that for me. Do whatever he tells you. This is like the Mariness motto. Do whatever he tells you. Guys, that's what we're called to do. Do whatever he does. Does Mary know what Jesus is about to do? She's got no idea. She just knows that her son can help. These people need help, and she wants her son to help. She's got no idea what he's going to say. Jesus could say, ah, I don't know. My mom's crazy. Like, if my mom came up to me and said, you know, I'm at a wedding. They're like, hey, they ran out of wine. And I'm like, all right, great. What do you want me to do about it, mom? And then she tells the head waiter, yeah, do whatever he tells you. They're going to come over to me. And be like, so your mom said you'd help? I'm going to be like, yeah, she's nuts. What do you want me to do about it? But Jesus, Jesus doesn't do that. His mom tells him to do something. He's like, all right, mom, I got this. So verse 6, now there are six stone water jars. They are for Jewish ceremonial washing, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. So let's do the math. Do, 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 six times 20 or six times 30? Yeah, you got it. That's 120 to 180 gallons of water. If you know where this is going, that's going to be a ton of wine. 120 gallons to 180 gallons. Oh my goodness. Jesus told them, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it. And when the water they tasted that had become wine without knowing where it came from, although the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves a good wine first. And then good when people have drunk freely an inferior one. But you have kept the good wine until now. Highlight that in verse 10. All right, understand this. Jesus is going to make 180 gallons of wine. Not only wine, but good wine. All right, and I want you to put that as the highlight. Highlight the entire verse 10. Everyone serves good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely and in a few more, but you have kept the good wine until now. Guys, good wine takes time. Wine tastes better with age. The more you let it sit in a bottle or it sit in a barrel, the better it tastes over time. You can't just create good wine like that. Cheaper wine is created quickly. Expensive, fine wine takes time. Jesus is able to create good, great, fine wine like that. That's what's so important about the, the distinction that this is good wine. Right? This is also going to fulfill the prophecy that an abundance of wine is going to signal right, the Messiah is here. So how, put that as a note as well. Right, Two things in this note. Jesus creates good wine, showing that 
This is a truly miracle, right? Uh, and then this fulfills the prophecy that an abundance of wine would signal the Messiah. Verse 11, Jesus did this at the sign of the beginning, the beginning of his signs in Canaan and Galilee. Just highlight that beginning of his signs, right? And this is the first miracle of Jesus, right? The wedding feast of Canaan is the first miracle of, of Jesus, all right? Um, you can go ahead and read the Catholic faith facts on the next page of verse, uh, page 49. Let me see what time am I at here. Uh, 32 minutes. All right, I think that's great for today, guys. All right, guys, thanks. Have a, have a good day. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. See you. Oh, Johnny, Johnny.